Awesome. Thanks. Hey, Jake. Hello. Awesome. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a nice meeting. You too. Have a good night. Bye. Hi, Ursula. Hi, Curtis. Hello. Hi, Hi, Julia. Hi there. Hi, Jose. Hey, Christina. Hi, everyone. We're waiting for... I just see Carrie. Hi, Carrie. Hi there.
Hi, Jake. Hi. Oh, I see Charlotte. I think we're just missing Steve Miller on the school committee side. Well, uh, I'm, I'm here. Oh, there you are. <laughs> yeah. We, I didn't recognize Steve's iPad. I think I'm. Right. I tried to make sure it had the right name. <laughs> Jake, are you waiting for anybody else? I see. It's hard to see everybody. There's so many people here. It's so great. We just, I'll check in and make sure. Yeah, I see Cindy on here. So I, I think we're all set, Christina. Okay, great. Hi, Cindy. <laughs> okay, I'd like to call the Mount Greylock Regional School District School Committee to order. It is Thursday, January 12th, 2023, and it is 6.01 p.m. We are meeting remotely via Zoom. This meeting will take place virtually pursuant to the law signed by Governor Baker on July 18th, which extends certain COVID-19 related measures. The meeting will be broadcast on WillieNet TV channel 1302 in Williamstown. It will also be posted to the Mount Greylock Regional School District YouTube page within 24 hours of the meeting and on WillieNet.org. First, I'd like to call the roll if the committee could just um, declare themselves here alphabetically by last name. Bowen here. Connery here. Constantine here. I'm going here. Green here. Malloy here. Miller here. Yeah. I'm going to mute a few. If I can read our mission. Okay, sorry for muting people. At Mount Greylock Regional School District, our mission is to create a community of learners working together in a safe and challenging learning environment that encourages restorative based processes, respect, inclusive diversity, courtesy, integrity, and responsibility through high expectations and cooperation, resulting in lifelong learning and personal growth. First up on our agenda is public comment. And we do have um, three people currently signed up to give public comment. Anyone else who wants to give public comment after they are done, if you could raise your hand virtually, you do that by clicking on reactions and there should be a button to raise your hand. And I will call on you in the order that I can see you. Um, each person should speak no more than three minutes. And if you could just tell us your name, the um, town from which you reside and the agenda topic or item you're speaking to, that would be great. First up on our public comment sign-in sheet is Brie De La Roca. And I apologize if I pronounce anybody's name incorrectly. Well, thank you for having me. You got my name correctly. So, um, hi, I'm Bree Delaraca. I am mother to Charlie in seventh grade and Fisher in fourth grade. I live on Mount Williams Drive in Williamstown. And I relocated here uh, a little over a year ago, and I did so um, largely for the education and the arts culture. So when we were preparing Charlie to transition from West to Greylock, um, I was really surprised to find that middle school students did not have curricular access to visual arts. Um, and I subsequently learned in talking with other parents that I was not alone in that surprise. Um, so I'm here tonight <laughs> to, in the hopes of changing that situation. I am advocating for the addition of a middle school visual arts teacher to join Mount Greylock in the 2023-2024 school year. Uh, last month, we had a great meeting with the school council and I was able to share a presentation of the research that has showed ample evidence demonstrating the importance of the arts in a student's education. So um, just to summarize, that research shows that students experience greater social and emotional well-being when exposed to visual and performing arts, 
that they advance in their academic achievements and engagement, and that they gain economic and civil mobility when they have access to arts curriculum. And those results are even more profound when they have access to the arts in middle school. So on the ground, this translates to fewer disciplinary actions, uh, fewer absences, and gains in overall academic engagement and um, aptitude. So having a robust and rounded arts program is also an indicator of being considered, you know, a great school. A review of private schools in the Berkshire County um, shows that each of these schools prominently advertises their dedicated arts education and facilities. And in reviewing public schools in Berkshire County, we've found that Mount Greylock Middle School is an outlier in its public peers. Um, Greylock's uh, middle school lags all of its public peers when it comes to student access in the visual and performing arts, except for three schools. Two of those are vocational and STEM focused. As it stands now, 78% of Massachusetts middle school students have access to arts curriculum in their public school education, whereas none of our middle school students currently have access to visual arts as part of their curriculum. The middle school is an arts hungry school in an arts rich area, and I think we can change that and I think we should change that. So when polled this year, um, a majority of Greylock Middle School students agreed and they reported that they would take a visual arts class if it was offered. So while we're focused on addressing the most pressing arts gap this year, we're also looking to build long term partnerships and bring expanded arts access to Greylock in coming years. But the first and most important step is to hire a middle school visual arts teacher to begin next year. And I hope you will vote to support this. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Amy H. I am not going to attempt to pronounce your last name. I apologize. <laughs> no problem. Amy holtz -Apple. Thank you so much for having us. I'm from Williamstown. I live on Hancock Road. Um, and I am here, uh, along with many people in this Zoom, I believe, um, speaking on behalf of, 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 of a community um, to express my deep enthusiasm and support for the hiring of a full-time visual arts teacher for the middle school. I am the parent of two kids currently at Mount Greylock, and I'm also an arts educator. As Bree has just shared, we know how transformative art education can be for our students. We know that experiences in the arts at middle school and high school level can develop social and emotional growth, teach greater empathy, and provide opportunities for creative expression. I'm here to share an additional viewpoint, a little more personal side of things, um, and consider what it means for kids to see themselves as artists from a young age. The ability to respond to the world creatively is something we all possess at birth. As John Lennon once said, every child is an artist until they're told they're not an artist. <laughs> In too many schools across the country, art education is often one of the first things to be cut from a curriculum. Every time this happens, another kid gets the message that she's not an artist. Luckily, at Mount Greylock, students have many opportunities to engage in the arts. At the high school level, students can participate in music, visual art now, stained glass, sculpture, photography, and at the extracurricular level, performing arts. My son Ezra, who is a senior, has spent all four years of his time at Greylock in band and in recent years, jazz ensemble, along with his participation in athletics, his experience in music has been central to his education, his growth, his socialization, and his maturity. Additionally, this year, Ezra is taking intro to studio art. He was a little nervous at first, but now he says it's one of the best classes he's taken at Greylock. The skills he's learning in this class are preparing him to see and interpret the world around him more closely and to learn how to share this unique interpretation with others using, in this case, pencil, charcoal, and paint. As the great arts educator Vivian Gusson Paley once said, we all have inside of us something only we can see and hear. It comes out in our stories, our play, everything we say and do. 
Haley was an advocate of the invented classroom, a space that gives students the freedom to interpret information in a way that correlates with their own lives. This is what an arts classroom does. I'm advocating for the addition of a visual arts teacher in the middle school at Greylock because such a move would give younger students the opportunity to see themselves as artists, as creators and makers of new worlds. Middle schoolers are currently given the opportunity to play music and at the extracurricular level, participate in theater. My daughter June is a seventh grader and has already loved her experiences in Fall Shakespeare and Winter Musical. I'm asking that the school committee grant the opportunity for all kids at Greylock, not just those in the upper school, to have an additional dimension of creative play, invention, and or interpretation open to them from the moment they step on campus as seventh graders. Every child deserves to be told they are an artist. Thank you for your time and support of this initiative. Thank you. Next up on the list is Kathy Albano. Hi, thank you, everybody. My name is Kathleen Albano, and I'm a second grade teacher uh, in my 15th year at Williamstown Elementary. And tonight I'm commenting on the budget item, the 2022-23 item uh, for Williamstown Elementary. Um, there are two suggestions that I would like for the school committee to consider uh, for next year's budget or maybe prior years. Uh, my first suggestion is hiring three more paras for our early childhood grades, one, two, and three. Currently, our preschool classrooms and our kindergarten classrooms, each teacher classroom teacher has a para of their own to help with students, uh, support students and their needs. And while those uh, kindergarten paras and preschool paras uh, have duties, they spend most of their time supporting the class and their teachers. Once students transition um, into first, second, third, as well as fourth, fifth, and sixth, um, there's only one para per grade level that grade levels have to split. So currently this year, we have four first grades, and we have one para that um, is with that those four grade levels. In second grade, we have three sections and we have one para that we share. Same with third grade, there's three sections, one para. This means that that one para has to split their time uh, within those four or three classrooms. And teachers are, are the ones that really try to divide up that time to best suit the needs um, of our students. Um, and also the paras that work in our classrooms, they also have duties, whether it be lunch duties, bus duties. Um, my reasons for um, suggesting some extra paras and help is uh, mainly student needs. Um, since the pandemic, we have seen so many more social emotional needs coming out as well as academic needs. And as a second grade teacher, um, the diff seeing the differing levels as kids come into second grade and their abilities, they really start to vary. And just having that extra body in the classroom to help support those kids um, is really, I think, important. And I think it's really time to give back to our classroom teachers. The second um, suggestion that I was uh, wondering if you, for you to consider is rehiring a technology teacher for our early childhood grades um, as a specialist. Um, we do currently have one teacher that services our whole school for technology, and she is absolutely wonderful, but you can imagine how busy she is. Um, whereas, a little history for you, last year, uh, we had gym twice a week, music once a week, art once a week, computer lab once a week, and library. Those are called our specialists. And four of those specialists, com including computer lab, were 45-minute blocks. Library is a little bit shorter. And what would happen is a computer teacher would push in or we would go out push in was really nice. And they would come in and help children navigate how to, you know, get on the computer, their passwords, um, how to use different programs. They were, she was such an asset to yeah, actually teachers because she knew how to use a lot more of the programs and also some of the testing that we're requiring kids to do on computers. So again, um, now what has happened for this year when we came back to school, um, computer lab, uh, computer lab was no longer, uh, but what replaced it was social emotional learning, which has been fantastic. And again, much needed specialist that has just been wonderful way to support teachers who are doing our social emotional curriculum. Now we have a 45 chunk minute of time where kids are learning wonderful things. However, what has this is left, um, it's leaving teachers 
having to try to navigate technology within the classroom with the students. Uh, first kindergarten and first grade have iPads. Second grade, third grade, fourth, fifth, sixth have um, Chromebooks, one and everything's one on one. Um, you know, COVID has really helped me, I think, and all my colleagues improve our tech skills. Um, but again, still, I am not an IT specialist, nor do I know all the passwords for everything, even with all my little books. Um, and again, in our world today, technology is so important and is moving at lightning speeds and having someone to teach us how to use it safely and appropriate developmentally appropriately is really important. Um, again, I want to thank you for allowing me to uh, have this platform to be heard tonight and speak towards uh, these two suggestions that I would like. Um, I think as a teacher, I feel like I have um, kind of a unique and insightful um, perspective as to what's going on in our classrooms. Uh, so again, I thank you and Happy New Year, everyone. Thank you, Kathy. Next up is Annie Art. Hi, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I just wanted to lend my voice to um, my uh, parent colleagues who have also spoken tonight on the need for a visual arts teacher at Mount Greylock Middle School. Um, I really hope that the committee is in support of this position and I appreciate all of their efforts um, for organizing for this and for having spoken so eloquently about it here tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Annie. Next up is Lisa. Hi, Lisa Conifan. I live in Williamstown on Moreland Street, and I have a daughter in seventh grade, Elizabeth Spellman. Um, she told me that she was also in support of the, uh, the proposal to hire a visual arts teacher at the middle school, and she wanted to lend her voice as well. Um, but I also just wanted to back up what Amy and Bree put forward here, and Annie also so backed up that we there's a lot of community support for this and uh, that's why I showed up tonight is I just wanted to lend my voice and I really can't say it any better and I know that the committee has seen that fantastic presentation that Bree put together that uh, so well articulates the need for this visual arts education in the middle school so I'm just here to lend another voice of support thank you thank you I don't see any other hands up I will pause for a moment to see if anyone else wants to give comment and then we will move on. Okay, so moving on to our next agenda item, we have our student spotlight, which is given by Charlotte. So Charlotte, I'll turn it over to you. Hi there, I hope everyone is well after our holiday break. School has started back up in full swing for the past two weeks, with midterms nearing on the 22nd, 23rd, and makeups on the 24th. The senior class just released the dates for our winter formal, which will be on February 4th, otherwise known as our snowball. All the students are very excited after homecoming. In student council, we have avidly been working before break on completing the student body statement of the cell phone policy, which was submitted to Mr. Schutz. A quick recap for the student body stance is supporting a policy that means phones away during class, but not, but not during non-academic times. However, if the administration really sees fit to adjust it, we still advise keeping a policy of allowing access to phones throughout the day, even in various ways through keeping it in a backpack or a cell phone keeper in the front of a classroom, if necessary, as a result of the apparent student support for security, convenience, and the safety of cell phones. Moving away from the policy, the Student Council has also been working on feminine and sanitary products that have been misused by the younger grades at Mount Gerlach. We have a subcommittee trying to find a fair solution that is a mediator between the misuse and the need, even if it's in the lower grades bathrooms. For speakers, we brought in Matt Tukshi, from Greylock Talks, who is a political science professor from Williams. This week, he this week, and he talked about the elections of the of 2022, and the kind of hypotheses people thought, and then the outlooks. Mount Greylock Register Educate Vote has recently organized him to return this following Wednesday after a great session, hoping to have more questions answered. For the sports and play. 
section, the, student, the winter sports have had great success with multiple games this week, including multiple successful wins from the boys basketball team. They have a very important game tonight. In the for cross country skiing, their home race was postponed, so their next race is scheduled for January 14th at Mohawk. The girls bas basketball team had a really close game against Aguam, but just missed the win. However, they still have a couple wins and will have a hopeful season. The boys wrestling team just had their first home se home wrestling match season yesterday with a fantastic turnout from multiple schools. And for our play. Oliver Twist, rehearsals have been continuously working after school to have a successful start under the direction of Mr. Welch. That is all I have for this month's update. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Charlotte. Next up on our agenda are principal updates. And I have Principal Jake Schutz from Mount Greylock Regional School Council budget input on here first. Hey, good evening, everybody. I'm going to share my screen. And put it on slideshow. So I'm going to start off with our school council but, uh, budget considerations. So this was the, the planning that goes into this is really start from the bottom up. Um, working with our student support team, our uh, administrators, our, um, our counseling team, and then finally it goes to our school council. So every year the school council, two major focuses of the school council are the, uh, is a school improvement plan in which we derive specific goals with specific, specific benchmarks and action items. So the, these are, this is just a snapshot of our five goals. All our budgetary implications can be um, tied back to one of our goals. I'll just pause for a second here to folks read through those five. And then moving on. So we have five specific requested resources. Um, and you'll see that um, I'll let you read through here about the five, and then I'm going to go through specifically and give uh, an example and a definition of those, those five. So moving on to our first one. Um, in relation to our academic achievement goal, specifically Span Spanish language, we want to hire an additional Spanish teacher. Other goals are to reduce the class sizes, offer additional courses for native speakers, and offer co uh, courses that are cultural based for students that may not necessarily um, initially be considering going to college um, and perhaps to hook them into a language or just to provide them with some cultural awareness. So just a few notes around, uh, around this implication. Half of our Spanish classes are over 20 students, several almost 30. And of course, smaller class sizes are better. I think um, anyone would, would likely say that, um, but specifically for the Spanish language, it's important for a, teach, uh, for a teacher to be able to hear and interact with students. And here I also, the, the third, second and third bullet is um, our explanations of two added classes that we want to incorporate. Uh, the first being a Spanish for heritage learners. And we have more and more students coming in to Mount Greylock that are native speakers. And it's not always appropriate to put them into a, a language class, class, specifically a Spanish class if they're native Spanish speakers, 
that corresponds with their grade. Um, it, it just often doesn't work like that. And it's very, it is very um, difficult because sometimes you might be a, a fluent speaker, but the grammar um, and other aspects of the language that you review in a lower level, they, they might be ready for that lower level uh, grammar, whereas the speaking and oral part of it, they might be ready for a higher level. So this would, would help those um, English language learners um, be able to take a language class that better fits their needs. And the second um, or the third bullet, which I, I mentioned a little earlier, would be a semester class. It'd be a survey of culture and language, which hope, hopefully would, would be able to hook students because language is not a graduation requirement for Mount, Mount Greylock. It is a requirement, however, for many four-year colleges. Uh, so the idea would be we would pre be uh, present sort of a, a scaffold programming where a student could, you know, dip their toes, if you will, into a language and potentially want to try for a whole whole year of, of a language. So if they want to eventually apply for college, if that is a requirement, which most four-year schools are, they'd be ready to go. Uh, so that's that's the first implication, uh, Spanish language. The second would be a behavioralist. Um, a behavioralist would work in our student support center, potentially. Um, a behavioralist is someone who has um, a background, who has specific training in restorative justice, in positive behavior intervention, and with dealing with students in crisis. So it's not necessarily to the level of, let's say, a social worker, um, but it's someone who, whose main task and goal would be working with students who are having behavioral issues. So right now we have an amazing space and we have an amazing theme and concept for our student support center, which has been a fixture at Mount Greylock for quite a long time. It's a space where students who have behavioral needs, who need time and space to um, process, you know, social or emotional um, issues. It's also the, the uh, student support centers is a place where students can go. They need to make up a, a test. So it kind of this this concept in the space which is there serves the needs of many many people. And typically we or historically we've staffed that position with a paraprofessional. And luckily um, we have been very lucky to have people in that position who had a natural talent for um, for managing and responding and uh, to students who need the support. Um, and those, even though some our, our paraprofessionals are some of our most dedicated, hardworking people, they're off, often not the uh, not the most trained. So here we're asking um, to create a position um, for someone who is more specifically trained for the tasks at hand for that position. Moving on to our third is a 504 coordinator. Here you can see the goals. Um, specifically uh, last year, we had, we created a half middle school dean, half 504 uh, manager or intake coordinator. And last year, we also spent the entire year, our, our counseling team and our admin team revamping our, our 504 handbook. And once we figured out how and what we were supposed to supposed to do, um, we realized that there were a lot of students in need and deserving of a five, 504 that 
weren't necessarily um, being served. And so now that we you know, got our flashlight out and shown it in the corner, we have really seen a, a need for additional support and especially coming um, after the pandemic, um, we realized the need is there. And we sort of, we did anticipate this uh, last year and the year before one of our top priorities were social, social workers in response to the social emotional needs of our students. <clears throat> well, now to sort of uh, catch up with, with the paperwork and specific protocol and, and regulation that we're supposed to follow up with, uh, we realize we have a lot to work to do um, as far as you know, making sure everyone has the correct plans, specifically these 504 plans. Uh, this slide just reviews a little bit of what 504s are, or are, and this this last slide about a 504 coordinator specifically. We have the last bullet there. We have over 50 referrals for 504 plans and 100 active 504 plans, and I would say that's that's not people abusing the system. Um, that is that is legitimate need. Uh, so that's our, our third requirement would be a 504 coordinator. Our fourth would be power school special programs. This is a software uh, add on. And this is an add on that would increase communication between special ed and 504 liaisons. And this is sort of the would be the final touch of connecting all the dots. So to make sure we have the resources, and the resource, resources are far and wide, but think of you know, social workers and everything they provide, as well as academic accommodations. Then the supporting documentation with the, um, with the 504s or IEPs, and then connecting the dots to make sure the educators who are with the students on the front lines the most of the time are aware of and apprised of immediate information. So I think that let the bottom note there really sums it up, um, able for them to visualize data through our current systems. We use PowerSchool. This is just a, an additional add-on. So it'd be an additional purchase to PowerSchool um, in order for us to um, identify at-risk students. I think that's the only slide on that. And last but not least is the visual arts, specifically to hire dedicated visual arts teacher for our middle school. So right now we have an enrichment program in our middle school where students cycle through a quarter of various enrichments. And those enrichment classes um, sometimes our visual arts, sometimes performing arts, and sometimes um, other classes offered by core content, uh, core teachers. So for example, we've taught mythology before. And we've taught, um, uh, I'm drawing a blank right, <laughs> right now, but we've taught very, you know, a computer, uh, computer literacy before. And so hiring here, uh, let's see, what do we have here? So these are a lot of the points that, that Bree made. Actually, I think these top three are points that I stole from Bree's presentation um, that, that she gave to the, the school council. Um, but the bottom point there is very interesting. So with a dedicated teacher, we'd be able to change this enrichment type, uh, luck of the draw, general rotation, of students in the middle school to a more elective based situation where middle school students have more of an option based on their interest. And that's how it works in the high school because, um, um, because that's where we've dedicated more of the resources to as far as teaching, teaching hours and teaching time where they can choose whether they wanna take a computer class, visual arts, um, uh, Know, an English class that's a you know the history of baseball 
and things like that. So this would really open up the level of choice our middle schoolers have. Jay, can I ask a quick question there? Yes, ma'am. Carrie, um, <clears throat> as I recall, the enrichment classes were only open to students who were not say in band or chorus or something like that is that would that still be the case for a visual arts teacher if if this was so it if there was if we changed from enrichment to an electives that would go into the lineup into the rotation so it would be possible for for both to happen um but there would still there'd be a possibility that there still be some sort of conflict where if band and visual arts were the same period or you had those same open ones available, um, there might be a, a conflict where you had to choose. Um, and that's just a natural consequence of a rotating schedule. Um, but it would be possible where you could take both a performing and a visual arts uh, class if we got into this um, elective base system. Great. Thanks, Jake. So in, in general, uh, I, I briefed you on five budgetary implications based on this year's uh, goals of our school improvement plan and success would require essentially hiring, creating four new FTEs and the purchase and implication of a power school special programs. So pending your, your questions, um, I would like to quickly go over our program of studies, which was also approved by our school school council last meeting, which Jake, won't be as long as this. Uh, Jake, I do have a couple questions as, about the requests. Is now the time to ask those or after the program of studies? I think that, yeah, this, this is great. Right now it works. Great, thank you. Um, following up on Carrie's question, I and kind of blending a couple different uh, things that we were hearing. I, are students who are on IEPs and need additional um, academic support able to access the arts curriculum? And are they now or? Well, well right now, if, if you say arts curriculum, there's not Sorry. a dedicated arts curriculum because there are no, uh, other than performing arts, we don't have a set uh, visual arts right. okay. class. Okay. Um, so say that one more time. And, so and, I, I guess I want to I want to make sure that students who have um, disabilities for which they need extra support during the school day also have access to arts programming that is that may be created. Gotcha. So uh, it depends. It depends. So say if they're taking a language and they're taking, say if they have an academic support period because uh, their IEP calls for it, then, pro then no. Um, but if they were not, then, then yes, they would have the, mm -hmm. the ability to fit that in their schedule. Okay. And, and some people have two academic supports periods because that's what their plan calls for. Um, so that's always a, a discussion. So yes, they'd have access to it. However, it would be you know, a team decision with the parent and the team as yeah. far as you know, how, how it weighed out. Um, okay. And there's been times before where we've decided, yes, the, the, you know, this you know, band or some other you know, art class is more important than a second academic support period at this time. Um, and so I hope that answers your question. Yeah. It, it depends. It does. I, and I had, I had another one, um, and this may be a little bit, um, I hope it's received in, with the spirit in which I'm asking it. Um, and that is the number of 504 plans that you just cited is really high. And if you add that to the number of IEPs that the district, I'm just you know, apply 80 or so, I assume, in the middle high school based on the district percentage and the number of students in the middle high school. I'm wondering at what point um, there's, and if there's any work that instead of having more kids, if, if there's a point at which the question is really about universal 
design in the classrooms rather and, and the um, way classes are being taught rather than having to make all the accommodations for so many kids if there's something that's more holistic. So it doesn't require as much management from a third person. Absolutely. Um, and actually, earlier this year, we had some professional development about you with uh, UDL specifically for, for that reason. Um, so, so yes, um, and I would, in, I would invite, you know, well, uh, yeah, sort of we're tackling at, at two fronts. So once you know exactly, you know, if you, if you dig down into it, which we spent a whole, whole year going through uh, PD, you know, what, what qualifies, what doesn't qualify, when the pushback, when you can't push back, um, that's, that's where we are right now. Um, but on top of that, we're also pushing that a lot of these accommodations are, are good for everybody. And so I, I do hear you. Um, and I think we'll, we have to keep pushing forward on, on both fronts. Is, was Josue, were you next? I, I can be, I don't, I don't want to, I don't, your, your role. No one else is speaking up. So. All right. All right. Go for it. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. And I, and I, I, uh, forgive me for asking you this question, but, um, as a fellow parent of a middle schooler, you know, the voices of uh, my fellow parents today, you know, and, and, and their perspectives really resonated with me. Uh, <clears throat> but your presentation, I think, were also, was also quite compelling, Jake. Um, you know, the, the, the need and the importance of a Spanish language therapist, a behaviorist, a 504 coordinator, and then a uh, middle school visual arts uh, teacher. Um, each of them seem important to me. Uh, and I hate to put you on the spot, but maybe you could speak for the school council. If, let's just say a big if, because of budget constraints, whatever that might be in our near future, um, could you, or would you, could, would, are you in a position to, to be able to speak for the school council um, to offer up maybe uh, so a, a list of priorities for these particular positions, which of these do you see being um, of, of paramount importance for, you know, for the immediate future? So I, I don't know if we did it on purpose um, or not, but we did not discuss priorities. I don't know if anyone else is on here from the council tonight, but we did not. And I don't know whether that was discussed in order to, uh, you know, to put the school committee on, on the spot or not, but, but we, we did not. Um, and I could offer my personal thoughts, but I, I think that would uh, maybe misrepresent, you know, the, 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 the uh, I'm, I'm tempted to ask you, Jake, there are lots of ears listening to you. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'll, I'll, if, if you, if you so chose to tell us what your sense was of what the, the greatest needs are, that I, I, I think we'd be welcome to hear it. Sure. Um, but I would also appreciate if it's just really difficult. Each one of these positions, you know, holds, uh, uh, you know, I, important degree of, uh, you know, important sure. to the school. And, and so um, with, with my perspective, wanting all of them and, and a couple more, um, I, I would say, you know, the most bang for our buck and the, the position that would sort of holistically help the most would be that behavioralist position. Thanks, Jake. Yes, sir. I'll scroll through the rest here. I don't see anyone, any other hands up. So, um, Madam Chair, if if it's okay, could I um, talk another few minutes on our program of studies? Of course. Okay. So, sort of in relation. Uh, so. Um, I'm, I'm, I want to hit the highlights on, of the program of study. Um, so I'm going to go sort of subject by subject. Uh, for, for science next year, 
uh, we're going to be running AP Chem, AP Bio, and AP Physics. Typically, Chem alternates, but, but because we ran it last year and we didn't run Bio or Physics because of a lower enrollment, we're going to run all three this coming year and then moving on uh, the following year, Bio and Physics will al alternate. So that's a change that many families will be and students will be looking for. Um, as far as world language goes, I mentioned we added those two classes and we added those classes in anticipation of being able to teach them. If uh, with our current staffing, we likely won't be able to, but we put them in there just anticipation of, we can also always retire them or just not run them, but they are in there. Um, also, we plan on continue, continuing our, our Latin program, pardon me, next year. And um, the, we are gonna combine a couple courses instead of having a separate eight and a uh, Latin eight and a Latin one, we're gonna combine those two classes because uh, typically if you take seven and then you take eight, you skip right to Latin two. So next year we'll have a Latin seven, a Latin one, a Latin two, a Latin three, and then we're gonna com combine our two advanced Latin classes, Latin four and AP Latin. But they're, that's the plan for continuing our Latin program next year. As far as the arts go, we are uh, bringing a retired course back into the lineup, Intro to Theater Arts, uh, which we're hoping gets enough, enough uh, traction that Miss um, Jackie Vanette will be able to run that course next year. In English, we're adding a communication eight class. This is a, it's a middle school class. It's a year long course. Um, this would also come into play if we change that enrichment versus elective uh, rotation. If we move to more of a, uh, an elective based uh, scenario, this communication eight class would run. And its focus is on interpersonal and formal communication um, in regards to presenting you know, basic and complex ideas. So those are the major changes for the program of studies next year. Um, I don't know if I mentioned history. Um, typically, like same as science where we rotate classes in and out. Um, we have a migration and movement and an urban urbanization and industrialization class. Um, and also a subject to citizen and a global citizen class that we used to rotate. We'd like to run those every year as long as we can get the uh, participation in there because those are more of a, um, they have a more non-Western uh, sort of theme and focus, and they're also more uh, civics fo focused. So nothing out of the ordinary there, but just a couple highlights that I wanted to bring to your attention that we'll also be presenting in a couple weeks to uh, any families in the evening that would like to come to the auditorium. So depending on your questions, that's, that's all I have right now. I have a question for the other Jake. Um, could this presentation and the outline of changes to the course of studies be put into the folder for this meeting so that we could yes. review them? Thank you. Yep, thank you. Any other questions for Jake? Hey, thank you very much, Jake. Thank you. So next up is the principal of Williamstown Elementary, Cindy Sheehy, with the Williamstown Elementary School Council budget input. Hi, everybody. Um, I definitely first want to thank the Williamstown Elementary School staff and also our school council for engaging in numerous conversations over the past several months to try and generate what our priorities would be going into the next school year. Um, I have a slide that I was going to show, but to be honest, I'm going to not share the slide, mostly because our budget priorities for the upcoming school year are um, pretty simple and pretty straightforward. Um, firstly, I am hoping that I am able to maintain the current staff 
that I have right now at the school in the next school year. Um, and then the second major, you know, budget request from me is to be able to increase my instrumental music teacher from a 0.5 FTE to a 1.0. Um, last year, we had some staffing changes and truly just we didn't have the numbers of student interest to support someone, you know, with the program at a 1.0 level. This year, we have a renewed sense of engagement and enthusiasm for our students. We're approaching 440 students. Um, I have someone in the position now who is working brilliantly with my music teacher, but also collaborating with Jake's teachers at the high school to be able to look at instrumental music on a more broad spectrum, as well as starting to incorporate things like chorus so that that could bridge something going into the middle high school. Um, and so for Williamstown, um, that's what we're hoping to do, maintaining the staff and also increasing that instrumental music position if possible. Are there any questions? Scrolling through. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Cindy. Okay, next up on the agenda, field and tract project committee report. Carrie, are you gonna lead this or? Um, yeah, I could just start out by saying that the um, packet contains a document that I drafted um, on behalf of the track and field committee, which met on Tuesday of this week. Um, it is meant to be a reflection of the conversation that took place in that committee meeting, but um, the motion well, I could just start with the motion if you'd like. Um, the motion did not carry unanimously. Um, there certainly was a difficult discussion and there was some dissent over um, you know, what we should actually do moving forward and how we should move forward. Um, but let me just bring it up here. So um, the track and field project committee voted five to one in favor of recommending the establishment of a committee to engage in a funding phase for this project. This vote came after much discussion with our OPM and architect and was based on the following information. So in that sheet, I outline a number of things that we've already talked about. Um, but what is new and what we discussed in the finance subcommittee this afternoon is that um, we do have some feedback from our town uh, officials, uh, Williamstown mostly, but a little bit of a uh, sense of where Lanesboro is at as well. And we did get some feedback as well from our OPM and architect during the meeting. So you've all had a chance to read it. Um, Joe, do you want to add anything to that? not to set it up but i'll certainly happily okay. escape yeah so the so the idea is to um essentially take time right this is what we talked about last week when the school committee met um to take time to do the work that we need to do in order to get the funding in place um the reason we need to do this when we maybe didn't think we needed to do it before is because we have these reserve funds, which we thought we would be able to access. Well, we can still access them, but we've also heard from the towns that they need us to use those funds for other purposes, essentially to, um, to be able to uh, reduce the requests that we bring to the towns while they're dealing with all these other budget priorities. Um, and then uh, we also heard, at least from one member town, that they may not be um, able or interested in um, approving um, a bond for this project because, again, of the other priorities um, and other bonding projects coming up, uh, specifically a fire station in Williamstown and a police station in Lanesboro. I don't know what the timing of the police station is, but the fire station in Williamstown, I think is hoping to um, you know, be 
resolved sometime between February and June. So um, that was new information for us. And then I don't wanna speak for John Benzinger because he's right on the call here and we can ask him ourselves. Thank you, John, for joining us. I don't know if Aaron's here as well, but you know, um, the, yep, Aaron's here and Brian is here. So we've got actually a good complement of our group. Um, and I should just let folks um, speak to the issues themselves, but I would also add that in terms of timing, you know, we, we um, requested an accelerated schedule from our OPM and architect. Uh, they've been working overtime, which is actually a little bit costly to us in order to get a project out to bid within a general time frame of when bidding happens. But as it turns out, what we heard from our architect is that um, the bidding this year, really the high, the high, the premium bidding time has passed. So even if we were to put these documents out to bid, the energy for bidding at this point in time is low. And the best time for us to be able to hit the ground or strike the iron when it's hot, whenever, however, whatever metaphor you wanna use is really um, next October. So to put the documents out in October and um, use November and December in order to um, you know, accept the bids and then award a bid and that kind of thing. So I'll stop there. Um, any questions you have? Again, we have John, we have Brian, I don't know if you wanna speak um, to your position in this. Um, I would love to hear from you. So if you'd like, but I'm not gonna put you on the spot. Yes, Jose. Thanks, Carrie. I'm happy to wait if folks from uh, this, this particular committee want to speak up. If you prefer, Carrie, I'm happy to well, wait. Well, yeah, just on the the uh, logistics here. So the committee um, took a vote, but that does not, I don't think, automatically become a motion on the floor of the school committee. So, Christina, would you like a motion made and then there can be further discussion? I think that makes sense. All right, so I'll move that on the floor of the committee. Um, and does anyone want to second it? Apologies, Carrie. That was maybe my question. Is what particular? What is the? Ah. What's the motion exactly? Sorry, I, I might have missed it when you phrased it at the beginning. Yeah. Well, so I'm I'm actually going to change the motion a little bit, if that's okay. So I'll move that the school committee accept the exertion the insertion of a funding phase of the track and field project work, which. Um, might include, well, let me stop there. It's a funding phase that would end October 1st. So it would be from now through October 1st. And it would be, uh, it would involve the establishment of a um, funding committee, I would say, um, fundraising committee that could manage this part of the work. Um, that may include a few members of the uh, track and field committee. Um, it may and should include more members of the community who are experienced with fundraising. Um, and we could still work with our consultants, our OPM and architect for certain aspects of this. They certainly bring a wealth of information to the table about what other schools have done and how they've done it. Um, I, my sense was that our um, athletic faculty would be tied up doing athletic things for much of the time that, in, and uh, we would need to be respectful of their time and the attention that they need to put to their athletic programs. Um, so it would be a different group. It wouldn't be Can the I track and field project comment? committee. Oh yeah, go ahead, Steve. I just want to make a quick comment before anybody seconds this. 
Uh, you said, <clears throat> I think, to run until October 1st or something like that? For the yes, that's line. correct. That would be the deadline for fundraising, October 1st, 2023. Right. So the, the only con the, the biggest concern I have with that is I'm a little surprised that we went through an accelerated process to try to get things ready and then are only finding out now that this was not the opportune time to be sending it. And so I worry if we put it into October 1st, I don't want to tie ourselves to that. Maybe tentatively have it as October 1st as the deadline, but I might actually push it up a little bit just to give us more flexibility. Gary, I can speak to that a, a little bit. Um, sure. I, I think what the, what the design team expressed to us with the experiences that they've had in this bidding season um, with their clients is that they remarked how, how quickly contractors were able to fill up their job cycles for this coming year and that they felt as though it was perhaps abnormally early for them to already show not waning interest, but to show signs of saying we're, 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 we're pretty busy for calendar year 2023. Um, so that, that was the, that was the um, position that, that they offered. Um, I think at the same time, um, the October 1st deadline is, it, it, it's going to be helpful to the fundraising committee to be able to put forward a deadline and to be able to work with a sense of urgency. Um, if that date ends up slipping, I, I I hope it's because there are even better things that that committee is working on to ensure greater funding or funding from um, areas that do not tax our, our local residents quite as much. Um, so that that's, I think, the purpose of the October 1 deadline more than anything. Um, get out in front of this coming bidding season and give ourselves a deadline um, that we can work towards very publicly. Um, to try to ensure that this project does go forward post haste, um, as opposed to slipping into potentially another year after this. Joe, um, can I interrupt for a second? I don't necessarily concur with what the architect said. We've gotten numerous calls from contractors expressing an interest. I think you have it as well, uh, expressing an interest in this project. He was talking about a project down in Southern Connecticut on the Gold Coast, which is a completely different market. Um, we always try to time our bids to happen, um, you know, after the first of the year before uh, good weather comes. Um, so I think we're bidding the Wakona track uh, uh, right now. Uh, that's a little different project than yours because it's not a field and it's just a redo of the track. But um, we're bidding it right now and we're getting good interest. Um, I do agree that ideally, if we can get out um, before the holidays next year, um, that would be ideal. So October would be a good, um, good, good time to bid the job uh, for the following season. But we, you know, you also got to take in consideration we didn't get engaged, and we didn't engage the architect until um, I, th I think uh, late spring this year. So we, there was no way we were going to get this job on the street, uh, you know, before the holidays this year. So, um, you know, we, we were just doing uh, what we thought was best for the project, um, and. Uh, I don't think we missed a bit in season personally, but my Thanks, opinion. John. I appreciate that clarification. This is John Benzinger from Skanska, which is our owner's project management company. All right, uh, Julia. Um, I first wanted to uh, second your motion because I don't believe that has happened. Um, and then I have some questions and comments, but I also see that Brian's hand is up. And so I wonder if we should hear from him first. Great, Brian, go ahead. I, um, I, do, I just wanna make a, a comment on just what's been shared so far. I think it's a, a little bit of a misrepresentation um, that there are, there are other ancillary reasons why, we're, why we would go into a funding phase. It's, it's not at all because anyone came to us and said, 
you should go into a funding phase because it's not a good time. We can't get the bids. We can't make the project go forward. We're going into a funding phase 100% because we don't have the funds. <laughs> That's the only reason. There's no other reason that we're pausing the project other than we don't have the funds to do it. And so, yeah, I think it's just, I just want to be clear. It's not, you know, as Steven said, how come we're hearing about this now? Uh, you're hearing about it now because we just found out how many, how much funds we have to complete a, uh, we have $2 million to complete a $4.1 million project. So that's, that's the only reason why we're going into a, a pause. So thank you, Brian. And in terms of the numbers, um, I, we, again, uh, we talked about it at a previous meeting, but um, we were able to receive a snapshot of the availability of the Williams College gift in December. That was about 3.5 million. Um, when you take into account um, some things that expenses we knew were gonna hit the, the, um, the Williams Fund, the Capital Gift Fund, um, the committee had previously dedicated or asked um, future committees to dedicate a million dollars toward a renewal fund. That would bring us down to 2.5 million, and it is currently a 4.125 million dollar project. So, we're looking at about a million six that we need to raise if the committee wants to stick to that um, one million dollar reserve renewal fund. So, um, and again, that's something that the committee can decide if it takes a new vote and says we don't need to save that much, we can use more, you know, those are things, but that's the target goal right now. It's 1.6125, I believe. Um, and um, yeah, those are the, the dollar figures. And again, you know, um, prior to discussions with the towns, um, we were thinking that the reserve funds would be um, appropriate. In, in terms of our ability to, um, you know, use funds that were not um, in the Williams Capital gift, but we're just getting a very different message from our member towns that um, they really need us to to save those for uh, in terms of bringing down our our budget request to the towns. So, Aaron, yeah, go ahead, Aaron. Aaron is also from Skanska, which is our OPM. Thanks, Carrie, for the introduction. I just want to go back on um, prior comments and concerns regarding also where we are financially overall for the project, the total assumed budget estimates, is that the building committee has done a really good job at bringing a project into design and incorporating everything that is going to be very important to the school. So we've had very lengthy conversations regarding value engineering and trying to bring this down to a, a lower cost that's more palatable, but you're not going to get a long-term investment. You're going to get things that you have to go back. So the building committee is really, along with John and myself and CHA, we spent a lot of time making sure that what the town gets for a product is something that's worth your money. And we could save fun, like a fair amount of money but we're not going to get anything that we're going to be able to turn around and look at and say this was perfect this is good and we're not going to a high level but the, i think the building committee has done a real good job making sure that program is covered and it's a valuable project but it's not they're not trying to spend too much money they're not they're not reaching for the stars and you know brian has been very good to make sure that the students are being looked at as future generations have something to be proud of Lindsay and everybody has done a really good project um, build here to get this thing to the point where we are right now. So I want to make sure that nobody is under the general impression that you know we've come up with a, a project that's very expensive. Thanks, Aaron. And then in terms of the project itself, um, you've all had a chance to look at the construction documents and we've requested feedback from the school committee. Um, the track and field project committee was able to give feedback at our meeting this week. There will be a few re revisions based on our conversations. Um, 
The goal is to finalize those documents in February and then put them in a safe place so that they're ready to go in um, mid-October. Any kind of revisions that need to be made in terms of code or any other item can be done at that point. Um, but, um, you know, this is just, again, um, it's, it's, it's going to be really important to be able to hit the ground running and we'll have the documents. We've put in the work. Um, I agree with what Aaron said. The committee, um, you know, everyone had an equal voice and everyone voiced their opinions all along the way. And we worked and worked and worked. We spent many hours um, on this project and our OPM um, team was extremely helpful. And our athletic team was extremely helpful. And I just want to thank everyone who participated in this. And we're going to build, you know, a good project. It's just going to be one year later, right? So even if we, um, you know, take until October to get our funding in place, um, rather than having a facility, an athletic facility that is ready for play in spring of 2024, it will be ready for play in spring of 2025. All right, so that's what we're looking at. And in the scheme of things, it's not, you know, as long as it feels that that time is gonna, you know, be here before you know it. Um, Steve, then Jose, then Christina. I'll first say, as has been sung to me, oh, is always a day away. And so while it may not seem that bad just one more year, we've done this one more year many times, and that's my concern. 10% of 4 million is 400,000, 5% is 200,000. What do we expect costs to be if we wait another year? I am strongly in favor of let's build this now. I think we should have built it earlier. We've already spent on the order of $5 million from the $5 million gift, and we still have 3.5 million left. We have spent a lot of money on things that normally would go to the towns. If we are gonna delay for a year, I would like to use that opportunity to try to convince the voters, the town finance and select boards about the wisdom of considering a bond. And I know, you know we talked about this in the finance committee meeting today about some of the concerns that they had, but if the endowment, as it has historically done, is able to outperform uh, the amount we will have to be paying in interest, then this is a chance for the principal to continue to grow for us while paying for the expenses. You know, this is how we've been able to have five million dollars in expenditures already, and still have three point five million, you know, still in the bank. So. Thanks, Steve. And we will continue those discussions. Um, you know, having more time right now will enable us to engage with the full um, finance committees and uh, select boards. And um, at this point, we've only been able to touch base with leadership in those committees. So we can certainly um, pursue, you know, multiple angles in terms of funding from local, town, state, federal government and um, individuals as well as um, institutions and organizations. So, um, all right, Jose. Thanks, Gary. Uh, two really brief questions here. The first one is, uh, will the makeup of the field and track project committee, well, that, that I'm assuming will that committee will stay in existence through the duration of the project until it's completed. Um, that's correct? That would be my hope, um, okay. yes. And then um, the second question is, is who then take, who, who's gonna take the responsibility for, um, I'm not sure the right verb here, but for, for finding members of the new funding committee, how will that get founded and, 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 uh, and created? Um, yeah, Joe, did you want to speak to that? I, 
I couldn't so, tell if you were raising your hand uh, or just fiddling with your pen. <laughs> I was I was just fiddling with my pen, but I could certainly speak to it if okay. It um, so I, I think there there are a few members of the field and track committee that that would love to be on that funding fundraising committee. Um, I think that you know, Brian on the call here is an invaluable resource. He he, he also um, the spring and the summer are very busy times for him, which overlap with a significant amount of the time that we'll have here. So I think you use willing using Brian as a resource for specific projects and asks and 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 things will make sense but I think we we need more people power with the organizational effort and and with the coordination effort um and so reaching out to members of the public who have significant experience within development fundraising both for athletic projects but also just within our two communities um, and understanding the network of of people and institutions that we have um, would be very helpful. So I think what what Carrie might have been looking for was I think um, Carrie, um, Jake McCandless, myself um, have have readily volunteered. I think that Brian Gill, Lindsay von Holtz, um, as busy as they are, I think they would do anything to see this built as soon as it can possibly get built. Um, and, and so I hope we could call on them, but probably not for areas where others can can serve the role because th their time is at a premium, um, especially as we move through the rest of the spring and then the summer. And just sorry, it's brief. I know while Julie are waiting, I just want to make sure I understood your the answer to this question. I think what I heard was that uh, it the the folks that will be in charge of um, pulling this committee together is going to be. I'm assuming Carrie, you, mm -hmm. Joe, and Jake that we will look to the three of you to bring this new funding committee together with I I would reasons. I would suggest Joe and I um, okay. could co-chair this and okay. then we will rely you know we will bring Jake in as as needed Got it. um only because that just seems more appropriate somehow I don't know. he has plenty of free time I think that's what he says I don't know yeah Julia? Yeah, um, I first just want to say thank you to you and the committee um, for this work. This is tremendous work and it is terribly disappointing news, um, but it's not the news we know is not your of your making. It is just you are the messenger. So um, thank you for, for that work and for for really um, considering fiscal responsibility here. I personally don't know how we can't support a motion that says we're gonna wait to have the funding to do a project. Um, but I, I, I guess one of my questions is um, October's really soon and that's a lot of money. Um, and so I, I guess I have a few questions for that and I'll just list them and then however they get answered. Um, I, if, there's, if we don't have enough funding in October, is there a plan B? Um, that's number one. Um, and I, do we have any leads? Because finding um, grants, can take a while uh, at grants that are specific for this kind of purpose um, and building the, um, you know, soliciting support and asking people to help pay for this is not a snap your fingers process. So do we have leads? You don't have to tell me names, but like, do you have ideas of people who might be willing to support this? Yeah, we actually did some really great uh, brainstorming. We've been brainstorming this for quite a while, but we were able to brainstorm within the track and field committee um, this week. And we do have a few leads. Um, I also spoke with um, someone at the state level of school committees just to see what other schools have done. And um, he was able to point us in a direction for some potential federal or state funding we need to talk with our representatives um, and get some political um, support for this as well. And um, 
I think Aaron and um, John were able to suggest a couple of directions that we could go. Uh, CHA was able to suggest, you know, the possibility of creating, um, you know, a funding flyer, right? You know, a way to really market this. Um, it would come at a fee, of course, but, you know, they're professionals and they would be able to potentially um, create something that we could use to uh, promote this effort. So there are lots of things floating around right now. Joe has been keeping a list and notes and um, we, I feel like we're almost like, we've been gearing up for this kind of behind the scenes a little bit for a while because we were planning to fundraise even with the project going out to bid now. So this is not a, a totally new conversation. Um, it's just a different context. Um, I don't think I answered your other question. Plan B. Um, yeah, that's a that is a really good question. Our plan is to build this project next year. So you know, if we have to, you know, I I don't know what the plan B would be. Um, Carrie, we we could bid it in January like we were planning. So that would buy you another three months. Um, yeah, okay. we could bid it in other you know. We could bid it in April if we had to and you know, turn it into a fall job, but uh, that's not ideal. Mm -hmm. I did want to address one other question. So we are pro uh, projecting escalation for you know all our clients. Um, it's been crazy the last couple of years. Um, we have been using 8% per year uh, recently. Construction for the last 50 years was you know 2 or 3% a year cost escalation, but the last couple of years have been crazy. We've been seeing a little downward um, um, spiral on uh, escalation uh, most recently. So I I would predict 6% cost escalation on that $4 million uh, figure Carrie gave you for next year's dollars. Thank you, Joan. Anyone else? Steve, I, I see your hand. I just wanna make sure that any, no one else has a question. Steve, okay, go ahead. Yeah, so actually that answered the question I was about to ask is just estimating how much we expect costs to go up if we wait a year. So that's about $240,000. So our fundraising efforts have to get at least that much as a start and hopefully we can get more. Uh, the other thing in terms of you know, plan B, I think that's an excellent question of something we need to have. I would propose plan B is that we build it no matter what. And if this means we spend down the endowment and we spend down some of the reserve funds, then that's what we do. And I think it would be good for the committee to have such strong language right now. I think we can, I, I don't disagree I'm with just you. Afraid we have this conversation time and time again. Think Yeah, Steve, I don't disagree with you. I don't think we need the language right now. I think we should keep in mind that um, we have options, you know, to spend more of the endowment, to spend more of our reserves um, based on how well we do in terms of our fundraising efforts. Um, but I'm, I don't think we need to commit to that right now. That's my own opinion on that. Uh, I actually think we do need to commit to that. So when we are talking to the towns about what we're going to do when we're saying, you know, our hope is to get a bond, our hope is to fundraise, but if we're not able to do this, then we are committed to doing this. And I think that shows resolve and shows that we really are serious about getting this done. Yeah, Joe? I, I feel differently, Steve, in that if, if that were the vote tonight, we would be indicating that we could fund this project without anybody's help. The, the reality is the way all costs are increasing across all three of our schools and with our budget as we look towards FY24 and with our town's early requests to limit our, our increases in our asks of them. Um, I'm not sure how if I was asked to recommend an outlay and a breakdown, 
I'm not sure what I would do because I would need to cut off numerous other things at the knees in order to make that possible. Um, and what we're trying to do now is we're trying to come up with a way to tap into funding sources that will not force us to sacrifice in those other areas. Um, and, and so I, I, I do want to continue the conversation with the towns. I do want to see the endowment grow. I do want to see our reserves remain healthy so that a variety of things are possible. But I also know that that a, a number of these areas, it is a zero sum game and raising money from individuals and institutions needs to be our first avenue right now. But that's that's my opinion. Christina, thank you, Joe. Christina, you had your hand up before. Did you ever ask your question? I I, I got to not ask my question because Jose asked it. I mean, essentially, okay. I was curious about uh, the thoughts about the difficulty of putting together the fundraising committee and um, and the difficulty behind raising those funds. So if if the committee votes to approve this, then we will move on putting a committee together. We weren't going to do that until the committee gave us that direction. Um, so that's what we need is a yeah. vote on this motion in order to be able to move forward with a fundraising effort. So are there any more questions or comments? All right, so all in favor of um, moving into a uh, fundraising effort by inserting a funding phase into the building and track project, um, roll call vote. Owen, aye. Henry, aye. Constantine, aye. Elton Bain, aye. Green, aye. Boy, aye. Miller, no. Okay, thank you. That motion passes six um, in favor, one against. So we will we will move forward and it's still gonna be a great project. I'm, we're all just so committed to it. So I'm, I'm still feeling hopeful. Um, note, there will be a car wash this coming oops. weekend. Not sure what that was. Um, was there anything else on this item that needed to be addressed? I don't. Not the financing discussion. Construction documents. Okay, so yes. now on to construction documents. Um, last call. Does anyone from the school committee have any? comments or questions on the construction documents that um, are going to be revised just one more time before um, being put in a sealed box in a safe somewhere <laughs> um, under lock and key. There's a safe in Otis we can bid for. Sounds good. Going once, um, do we need to, um, yeah, Jose, we, we are prepared to pull up the irrigation plan and drainage plan if you'd like to, to see that. Um, I'm not sure if that's what your question was for. About. No, 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 thanks, Carrie. Okay. Um, no, I was curious about what, we have a vote schedule, so I just wanted to make sure I, I knew maybe what, the, what we were voting on exactly at this moment. So at this moment, you're not voting on the construction bid documents. We're going to do that at our next school committee meeting, and that will give the architect time to um, incorporate the feedback that they got at our last track and field committee meeting. So again, just an opportunity to give feedback. Um, you can still do it by email to Joe. Um, but we need it by, what was the date? 
February 1st well, is when, or second. Keep well, I, I would say that if there's any feedback that can be given, um, part of the, the vote that we just had means that CHA is not going to have people working overtime to make sure this gets out to bid within the next two weeks. Um, but you know, every revision takes additional hours, additional expertise brought forward to make sure that everything's coherent. So if there is any feedback that people want to give, please give it give it this week so that we can make sure to get that over to CHA. Um, what the what the project committee did was um, we individually and as a group, we went through a lot of areas in detail, um, identified some holes, identified some gaps between between what's a base, what's an ad alternate, what does it mean if you go in various directions um, and ask some questions about, about final plans for drainage, um, irrigation, things like that. So we, we worked on those details. Um, if the committee has any input that it wants to make sure we incorporate, please get those um, ASAP so that we've got a good measured time to get a final draft um, done and, and reviewed and ready for approval and for the magic, uh, magic vault. Thanks, Joe. Okay, all set, Carrie? Yes, thank you, Christina. You're welcome. Okay, moving on to approval of minutes. Would someone like to make a motion to move the December 8th, 2022 minutes? So moved. Was that Carrie? That Julie. was Ursula. Oh, that was Ursula, no. thank you. That Julia. was Julia? It wasn't me. Oh, oh. Sorry. That was Julia. Okay. Um, I'll second them though. Thank you. Any discussion? Um, I think I might have had one thing. Hang on one second. Okay. December 8th. So interestingly enough, I'm listed as the co-chair. I don't mind being co-chair. I kind of like that, but I don't think that's technically the, the title of it. It's not important, but um and then in the number nine section, I'm not sure what this was supposed to say. It says C Green shared that financial reports are forthcoming and stated that a review of a master calendar for the school committee to follow that aligns with our budget cycle, school improvement. I think stated that she, um, she would like to see a master calendar. I think that's probably what I was getting at that aligns. So stated that she would like to see a master calendar. That's what I remember too. Yeah, okay. So that was my only correction there. Okay, anybody else? Hey, all in favor? Owen, aye. Henry, aye. Constantine, aye. Milfin, by an aye. Green, aye. Abstain. Did we lose Steve? Oh, there he is. Oops. Yep. Uh, abstain. Okay. That motion passes with five yeas and two abstentions. Would anyone like to make a motion to approve the January 5th, 2022 minutes? So moved. This is Julia. <laughs> Julia moves. I saw you that time. <laughs> Do I have a second? I'll second, Ursula. Ursula seconds. Any discussion on those minutes? Corrections. Okay, hearing none, all in favor? Bowen, aye. Conry, aye. Constantine, aye. Nelson, by an aye. Green, aye. Malloy, aye. Miller, Sorry, Miller Steve. abstain. Thank you. See that motion. Passes. It's breaking up. I, were you able to hear me? Yes, in in um in broken up, but we got it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so moving on. Next up, we have the finance subcommittee report. Joe, is that you? Yeah, Jerry, why don't you take that away? 
<laughs> or I would love to take that away. Um, all right, so within the finance subcommittee, we've had a couple uh, non-project things cooking. Um, we had done a, um, a review of fiscal year 23 um, to date um, in some amount of detail. Here at the school committee level, what I would indicate is that um, we're on track so far, um, staying within our means. Um, and at the same time, we're, we're only halfway through the year, so we've still got plenty plenty of time left to uh, to falter, but I really hope that, ha hope, and I'll try to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, that's the fiscal year 23 update year to date. Are there any questions from the school committee as far as? All right. Um, next up, the FY24 budget timeline. In your packet, you, you've got a series of meetings um, for this committee, for the finance subcommittee. Um, and some uh, possible dates for our um, our meetings, uh, our, our times to present to the finance committees of our two member towns, um, as well as our town uh, member towns meeting dates, uh, town meeting dates. Um, all of those are laid out. the The trajectory that we're on is um, it's a little bit special this year, and you know, I feel like I've been saying that for for three years in a row now. The reason it's special this year is um, with the change in um, governor that we have in the state of Massachusetts, um, we will not see numbers from the state for Chapter 70, 71, or for uh, the minimum local requirements um, that are expected from each of our two towns that that drive the percentage split. That they drive a portion of the percentage split um, of assessments between our two member towns. Um, we will not see any of that from the state until early mid March, which is very different from a typical year when we we might start to get some information in December and then early January, and by the time we hit. Late January, typically we've got some real numbers to work with. Um, what that means is that our budget development cycle right now, everything that we're doing will be absent our chapter 70 contribution, our chapter 71 contribution, um, as well as absent firm numbers that we can use to understand the percentage increases that that will create on a, on a shared basis between our two member towns. We can certainly work on overall total budget, what's happening, um, what does that mean for percentage increases overall, but in terms of how that actually splits out between our member towns, we won't have accurate things to bring to you or to our towns until mid-March. Um, as a and, result of that. And I'm just gonna say, if you think that's bad, this is true of the entire state of Massachusetts. I mean, so as wild. a result, um, it makes sense for us to not hold our public hearing and approve a budget until we have the numbers necessary to approve the budget. Um, and that's why we we put March 30th um, as the public hearing date into that timeline that you see. Um, and we've been in discussions with uh, our member towns to make sure that when we do present to finance committees, we're actually able to talk about the percentage increases that, that we're bringing to the table with them, um, which is why we have a tentative date for the town of Williamstown of April 5th, and, and we're working on a similar date um, with the town of Lanesboro. Um, so that's the kind of timeline that we're on. I can speak to some of the early numbers and, and uh, the what's and why's of things in a second, but are there any questions on the timeline? Okay. Yeah, it, it, it is what it is, is, is definitely the phrase that, that is operable here. Um, in terms of early, early inputs, um, as you know, uh, we're, we're negotiating all of our union contracts um, to start in FY24 and go through FY26 right now. Um, so in terms of uh, exact salaries that, that um, our union employees will receive. We, we don't have firm numbers. We, we've got some things that we're working with internally. Um, no matter what, um, and I'm going to share my screen here. 
so that we can get some of this stuff in front of us. No matter what, if we keep all of the staff that we have right now, never mind bringing new staff into the mix based on school council requests or student needs for, for additional staffing in areas. Um, we are currently working with um, some of these figures that I've got up on the screen internally. And I'm gonna walk you through it kind of from the, from the middle up and then down to the bottom. In the middle here, the 25,072,157, that's our FY23 gross operating and capital combined. That's using all funding sources. That's our, our local towns, chapter 70, chapter 71, grant money, our E&D use, our tuition use, and our school choice use. So that's all funds all in. That's the, that's the top line number. Um, the 17,400,000, that's our FY23 local towns operating assessments. So that doesn't take into account capital. It just takes into account what our towns are sending us for the operating budget that we're, oper that we're using this year for our staff and non-staff budgets. Um, those numbers are important because when we do go to communicate our budgets to our local towns, they are going to key off of, in particular, that any change that we have to the 17,400,000 figure there. Um, when we are talking internally about how we can limit the impact that we have on our member towns, we're going to be looking at the gross operating and capital combined. And we're going to be saying now that new COVID money is probably not arriving. Now that we have a commitment that we've made over the years verbally to our towns to make sure that we're able to um, deflect and defer some of those costs by digging into the reserves that we just talked about with respect to the project, to the field and track project. Um, how can we contain our gross increases within funding sources that perhaps are not purely our, our increases to our local towns? So those two numbers for me are ones that are like, if you see them up on post-it notes around my office, like those are, those are numbers that are really important to indicate um, what we need to be able to do and what we need to ask. Um, now, if we jump back up to the top, um, if we look at where, we, where we're headed right now for our projected utilities and supplies cost increases, um, our electricity contract is something that um, historically we've, we've always been very fortunate to have kilowatt hour prices that are that are lower than pretty much anybody else. Um, and, and I give credit to Rob Winook and 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 the group that he works with to to bid those and to and to do everything that we can. Um, we are going to see an increase this coming year. We're we're not immune to it. Um, our current electricity contract expires at the end of this June. Um, and that's something that that we put out to bid at at what we thought was the right time. Um, earlier this fall for, for the next um, three years. Um, we also have other utility costs, um, natural gas and oil, um, propane that will, um, that will see some increases. Um, where exactly those head, honestly, I, I think if anybody's got a crystal ball, um, they're, they're probably already making a lot of money off that. Um, but we're, we're being um, conservative here with um, those cost increases that we're forecasting. And then supplies, you know, we're, we're seeing increases in, in the cost of paper and the cost of um, a lot of the more mundane things. Those won't trigger huge increases, um, but, but we definitely see some of our consumables within workbooks, um, curriculum materials. Um, we're seeing increases there as people are putting out their FY24 um, pricing sheet. So we're incorporating that into, into what we're starting to look at. So that's how we're coming up with a $90,000 number there so far for the increase that we're going to see. And those I view as um, fairly unavoidable cost increases. Um, yes, we can wiggle around. Yes, we can, we can try to be more energy efficient. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it wouldn't be prudent to assume that we can, that we can get out of that. Um, 
the $750,000 number that we see for currently projected staff salary increases, that um, the vast majority of that is within our union contracts. Um, a lot of that is natural step and column progression, um, as well as just uh, percentage increases that we think are responsible to budget for um, based on negotiations around the state and, and negotiations that we're having. Um, so that $750,000 number, that's just a placeholder for me right now. You know, the, the exact number um, will be different, but we, we need something to work with to start to set expectations and understand what kind of trade-offs we're gonna be making. Um, health insurance premium increases, which are, are annually um, a topic of discussion and, and can trigger some pretty significant percentage increases in our budget overall. Um, those premiums will be voted at the end of January um, in Berkshire Health Group's meeting. Um, so by early February, we'll have those numbers and we'll be able to bring them forward. Um, our retirement contribution increases, um, those are dictated to us. And uh, similarly, by the end of January, we'll be able to bring those forward to you as well. Um, so all that said, now we're going to jump down to the bottom. 3.4% um, is the increase that the $840,000 that you see on the screen triggers as far as an increase in the gross operating and capital across all funding sources. Um, if, if, and I, I want to make this very clear so that whatever is, is spoken about, written about, if we were to pass all of those increases onto our member towns saying we can't reach into reserves we can't, we're not seeing chapter 70 increases um, and we're, and we cannot utilize the same level of grant funding that we have in this current fiscal year. Um, we would instantly be passing a 4.8% increase on to our member towns. How that splits out, whether one town sees a 5.6% increase and the other town sees a 4.1% increase, that's what's determined by what the state tells us in terms of minimum local contributions that are required by each town. So that comes in in March, but neither of our towns wants to hear 4.8%. Um, so, and this is where I, I, I can see some of you on the screen right now. Um, this is where we will butt up against school council requests our own requests based on, on other needs um, transiting across the entire district. Um, this is what we're gonna be bumping up against. So it's, it's um, something that we are actively managing and thinking about right now, but I just wanted to give you that early sense of just holding steady, this is what we might be seeing. Um, so we're, we're gonna have to put on um, even more thinking caps and, and probably uh, propose even more trade-offs um, but we, um, we internally, we have a, a pretty serious commitment to um, the staff that we have, to the, to the program of studies that we have, to the, to the way that we currently operate our buildings. Um, so we're going to be pulling every lever that we can and figuring out everything that we can do um, to keep that 100% whole first um, and only then reaching out into into other areas, additions and, uh, and expansion. So um, comments, questions, I know there are concerns, so I won't even ask. So um, this is Carrie. So I have two questions. One is logistics. So can you drop this into our, thank you. Um, the second is what, what should our visual art uh, supporters on on this call take away from this? And you know, those supporting other uh, priorities in the Mount Greylock plan. Um, I I will give you my take first, and then and then I think others might wanna might wanna jump in. Um, I hear those requests, I agree with them. I am not sure whether there are trade-offs that we can make to achieve those. Um, but I think, and, and, I, and I, I said this to the principals earlier this week, I think it's really helpful 
to clearly articulate what you want and and why that is a very reasonable want to have. Um, but then that does need to bounce up into these discussions that we're going to have over the course of the next couple of months to try to figure out how we can achieve that if we can achieve that. Um, so I I I loved what was said and I want it. Um, and now we just need to figure out whether we need to sacrifice something else um, or if we can find other ways to, to make it happen. Christine, are you taking comments from, or should are we permitted to take comments from the public here? Unfortunately, we we can't. We can only do our public comment segment at the beginning. So, Steve, you're up. So, I just wanted to build off uh, what you ended with, Joe, about. Um, sacrifice and I assume we will start some conversations along those lines at the finance subcommittee, looking at what we have now and say a visual arts. Some of the things we are currently doing. Is that correct? Steve, we lost you. You broke up between the beginning and the end. Um, What I was just saying is just, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, I was just with. Yeah, that's not working. Um, yeah. Steve, Would we start those conversations in the finance? Yeah, we will be uh, having these conversations in the finance subcommittee and as well as the full school committee. I'm not sure if that was your complete question, but. I, it was basically just say you had mentioned, Joe had mentioned the need to possibly make sacrifices. And I was just wondering if we would start some of those conversations in the finance subcommittee, just looking at what are we doing right now? Do we value all the things we're doing now over some of the... Right. So what are we doing now that we could stop doing, um, if anything? And... Um, you know, not necessarily take what we're doing now as the way we want to be doing it, but to rethink how we're doing things. That seems to be, um, you know, what lots of institutions are doing at this point, given budget constraints. Julia. Yeah, I had um, two thoughts. Uh, following on that conversation, I, I, or that question, I guess I would encourage I think this is where our mission has to come front and center and be the filter through which we think about the budget priorities. Um, I'm, a, I, I'm a little bit concerned because our mission is very broad <laughs> as it needs to be, but there's a lot in there, but I do think that has to be the, the filter. And that may help to your point, Carrie, of saying, we can't assume everything that's happening right now is what needs to be happening, but we need to say, are we meeting the mission of, of that our community has set? Um, one more mundane maybe question for Joe um, listed today was discussion of the tuition agreement and rate and then I also wonder about school choice just as potential revenue streams um, we're talking about you know cost but how can we just increase the revenue so yep um, in uh, the early February meeting we will bring forward a an updated tuition agreement um, as far as what that means for rates and revenue um, the, the current expectation is that um, the rates will increase in, in the way our costs have over the last few years, our, our per pupil expenditures have, I should say. Um, and uh, that is the model that we've used um, for the last uh, four years. Um, and we expect that to continue. Um, we have a good working partnership with our tuition in towns. Um, and so we're, we're expecting to bring that forward to continue it. Um, with respect to school choice, um, I'm not sure when school choice proposals um, and, and estimates exactly will, will be available. Um, 
but um, we should, it's, it's worth me noting that, that we made a push um, for this fiscal year to begin to um, utilize choice in the same way that I, I think we had, we had years ago and, and we had um, avoided using as much during COVID when there were as many question marks as there were. Um, and so I, I don't think we're currently projecting a significant expansion in, in school choice revenue um, beyond what we've already done. Um, but the use of the revolver that we have, um, that we do have a healthy reserve within, will definitely be um, a significant point of discussion within the administration, within the finance subcommittee, and then here within the school committee to allow us to, to do what we need to do. All right. Um, any other questions about the current budget process? That's it. Is there more on this part of the agenda, Christina? No, nope, that was it. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Carrie. Thanks, Joe. Okay, next up on the agenda is policy and governance subcommittee report. So I'll turn it over to Jose. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, everyone. Um, we have three items for discussion. One of those items we've scheduled a vote for. Uh, we would like to. Um, acknowledge that there's an error in the agenda as it's written. Policy BGB on policy adoption is listed as a discussion item. Um, it unfortunately is not a discussion item, but we are presenting it today as a information item. Um, school committee members and members of the public can find this uh, particular policy in the meeting packet and, uh, and the policy and governance subcommittee look forward to uh, discussing this particular policy and potentially um, suggesting changes, edits, amendments, uh, and offering this up as a discussion item at a following uh, school committee meeting. Policy BGC is something that the policy and governance subcommittee has not discussed as recently as last night. Um, it has never been listed as an information item, um, and we believe this to be uh, listed as a discussion item uh, erroneously. Uh, that said, policy BDE and policy CBI, we are offering first reads uh, as discussion items. Um, Curtis, you'll hear Curtis's lovely voice uh, for the next few minutes here as he uh, uh, reads out, provides these first reads for everyone. Uh, on policy BDE, uh, subcommittees of the school committee, uh, you can see in red as, as uh, Curtis will read the edits that we're suggesting for this policy. Um, our subcommittee, in addition to welcoming any feedback from the full committee uh, from this first read, we do have a specific question regarding uh, the edits that we are proposing to the full committee, principally around the potential for the absence of a, a fully functional finance subcommittee were this, uh, these policy amendments to, uh, to be approved by the full committee. So Curtis, would you mind uh, uh, reading the uh, edits for the proposed update of this particular policy? Will do. Uh, BDE subcommittees of the school committee with proposed updates. These school committees shall appoint members to subcommittees at the first school committee meeting following the annual organizational meeting for a period of one year. These subcommittees may be created for a specific purpose and to make recommendations for committee action. One, the subcommittee will be established through action of the committee. Two, the committee chair, subject to approval by the committee, will appoint the subcommittee chair and its members. Three, the committee chair, subject to approval by the committee, will provide the subcommittees with a list of its functions and duties. Four, the subcommittee will make recommendations for committee action, but it may not act for the school committee. And five, all subcommittees of the school committee are subject to the provisions of the open meeting law. Thank you, Curtis. I foresee a successful career on audible.com in your future. Um, uh, just to refresh everyone's memory, my memory included, I believe the, uh, the, reason that, the, the reasons that motivated uh, these amendments had to do with our most recent 
November discussion where we very quickly had to uh, decide, uh, or, or particularly <laughs> Christina had to decide who was going to be sitting on particular subcommittees. Um, this would allow the chair uh, a month from their appointment uh, to define who uh, would be available to sit on particular subcommittees. If this were to be approved, it would mean that we would go potentially a whole month without a functioning finance subcommittee. And that's where um, Julia thankfully brought that up as a, as a real concern. Carrie? Um, yeah, thanks, Jose. I had a question on number four, but before that, the, the I wonder to the point that you just raised and that Julia raised, if there could be a clause that enables the subcommittees from the previous year to continue until new committees are appointed, that would resolve that. Um, there, there is a reason why we we uh, we miss you, Carrie, uh, uh, and that this would be a reminder of that. Um, thank you. Well, but it doesn't yeah. work though if like this cycle where there were five, right. four four or five seats up, That's five right. seats five up seats. That's right. on the ballot, if that was five new people, then you can't carry over the subcommittee. I mean, in theory, that shouldn't happen infrequently. It should really only ever be four max, I think, if it were working correctly. But still, um, that that wouldn't work. Yeah. So to my question on number four, um, is it true that the school committee never delegates um, authority to a subcommittee? Because it seems to me that occasionally the school committee has delegated authority to, whether it's finance, to approve, you know, certain um, like Williams capital gift um, invoices, that's authority or to the track and field project committee, there was talk, if it didn't happen, I don't remember if it actually happened, but to delegate authority um, to that committee to move from one phase into another, right? So I'm just wondering if that's an absolute or could it, could it be that we would insert some language that something like, unless specifically directed by the school committee? I'm uh, I'm trying to be Julia and take notes, uh, Carrie, and I, I do a very poor job of that. So that's why the to pause there. Um, the great news is, Jose, you can always go back and view this lovely video. I do frequently, Christina. I, I do too. To <laughs> now I'm going to go back and listen to Curtis read policies. Oh, there's more coming from Curtis. Stay tuned. <laughs> there's more. Um, so if I got that right, I think the language that you were suggesting, Carrie, to, to help deal with for is that uh, the subcommittee may make recommendations for committee action, but it may not act for the school for the school committee unless specifically directed so to do so by the school committee, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. is that right? Okay. Yeah. Um, Julia, would you like to speak to, and Jake is 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 a superstar. Uh, but Julia, would you like to speak to your concerns about that finance subcommittee dilemma? I don't know if this is something that we, maybe we can hear from other school committee members if they. Um, yeah, I, uh, I mean, I can, I, I, you capture the, the question and the concern that um, we discussed yesterday, which is um, most of the committees, it's fine if they don't meet in the month of November, except for finance. Um, and the, quick you know, idea would be just to have the finance committee carry over or maybe say all committees you know, continue until reappointment. Um, but in the rare situation where like this past year, it could have been all three school committee members on finance could have been, you know, they were, they were all you know, on the ballot. Um, but maybe, so, so we, we wanted to raise that in case there were people here who thought they had ideas. And also, um, 
Jake was going to do a little bit of digging um, to to kind of try to identify potential answers to that and to see how other other um, districts handled this. Um, I think we're only I hope we're halfway through our full agenda. Uh, so I don't want to rush us along, but Carrie, yeah. I do have a suggestion. So um, the chair is appointed at the first meeting and the subcommittees are appointed at the second meeting. So the chair could serve as a de facto chair of the finance subcommittee for that period of time. And that is why we pay her the big bucks, ladies mm -hmm. and gentlemen. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Gary, can I ask you to say that one more time, please? Um, yeah, all I said was that because the chair is elected at the first um, meeting in November, right? The first meeting after elections, I guess, uh, general elections or school committee elections, the chair is elected in November and the committees are appointed in December that the chair, if needed, could serve as the finance committee chair until such a chair was appointed. Harry, can I add one item to that? Go ahead, Steve. Steven. Do we ever have anything where we would need to have a representative of both Lanesboro and Williamstown on the finance committee? You know, do you want to extend that to the chair and the assistant chair uh, on the finance committee? I don't, from my advantage, I don't see any reason why uh, we couldn't include that language so that there would be the chair and assistant chair. Um, Assuming the chair and the vice chair are from separate from towns. Two separate right. towns. Right. Well, that, that's what I was trying to remember is, are they supposed to be from different yeah, towns or is it just recommended? And again, I, recommended, we've changed yeah. I don't know anymore if we have to have a representative from each town on the finance committee. We've always done that. We've always had at least one Williamstown and at least one Lanesboro. Yeah, I I think it's all just committee um, preference, right? Because we really want to have both towns represented on the finance committee. Of all committees, we need to have both towns represented. But I don't I don't think it's in our policy manual. Okay. Does someone? I don't know if anyone wants. We can we can, we can look into it because we've got another. March 1st subcommittee meeting where we can look into right. this in more detail and then offer potentially um, a second read and a potential vote on, on edits. So we've got time to, to, to sort this out. And if it's not in the, that's also, we could also look at, I, I don't believe, Joe, that's contained within the language of the regional agreement, which would be another pathway outside of the policy manual, but, but we can look we can look there too and see. Right. And again, I think we've all said this at one point or another at a meeting. We view ourselves as representatives of the community of the district. I just want to make sure because we've been under you know a couple of different documents over the years that we don't have anything that explicitly says we have to have representation from both towns on this. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. I think we'll we'll look into it. Joe, I don't know if you want to to speak up now. The, the the only area where um where the the only area where something like that is codified i believe is in budget adoption that that it needs that at least one member of each town needs to vote in favor of a budget in order for it to be adopted i believe that's the only area um but i'll i'll double check before the next meeting yeah thanks joe we've got we've got time any any other comments or uh, concerns regarding this particular policy? And we welcome feedback from uh, from from everyone. In all honesty, regarding every every policy that we consider, um, and we have six weeks between effectively now and when we meet again to to further improve this version of the the policies that we see before us. All right. 
moving on to a policy CBI evaluation of the superintendent. Um, this is something that has gone through many iterations and many discussions, both within the full committee and uh, within our particular subcommittee. Uh, Curtis, do you, do you have water nearby? You have a, a glass of refreshment, uh, hopefully? I am uh, refreshed. All right. Uh, take it away, please, for the first read. CBI evaluation of the superintendent, new version. The role of the superintendent is to guide the district in achieving the district's mission, vision, and goals. The, super, the school committee then works with the superintendent to determine the goals and standards upon which the superintendent will be evaluated. Evaluation can serve the purpose of helping the superintendent continually improve their practice and performance. Through evaluation of the superintendent, the school committee will strive to, one, ensure that the efforts of the superintendent are focused on district goals and that the standards of professional practice established by state regulation are met by the superintendent. Two, ensure that the school committee and superintendent agree on the immediate priorities amongst the superintendent's responsibilities. Three, provide excellence in administrative leadership of the school district. Four, develop a respectful and productive working relationship with the superintendent. To support these efforts, the school committee and superintendent will periodically review a set of performance objectives based on the needs of the school district in keeping with state regulations for the evaluation of the superintendent. The superintendent's performance will be reviewed in accordance with specified goals and standards. The timeline of evaluation and assessment will involve the following. One, annually the superintendent will provide a self-evaluation report to the school committee by the end of August. Two, every two years, the school committee will conduct an evaluation of the superintendent based on the self-evaluation report and other pertinent information by the end of September. Three, following the evaluation, the school committee will present its evaluation of the superintendent at a school committee meeting in October. Four, semi-annually, the superintendent will provide a brief assessment of progress toward goals to the school committee. And five, Annually, the school committee and superintendent will agree on the superintendent's continuing and or new goals for the current school year in November. At a school committee meeting, the superintendent will present these goals with the opportunity for the school committee to suggest amendments, and the school committee will then vote to approve the goals. All school committee discussions and deliberation related to the superintendent's performance evaluation shall be conducted in open session in accordance with the open meeting law. My heart skips a beat every time uh, I, I hear your voice. Um, this Andy, is CNN. <laughs> you know, this is why I stepped off so Curtis could come on, just so we could hear his policies. <laughs> He's going to recite the entire policy manual into an audio book so we oh, can all sleep uh, well at night. Honestly, honestly. Um, the regional agreement, too. That would be fantastic. Wow. Uh, any uh, comments, feedback, questions, or concerns that anyone wants to raise after this uh, excellent first read? Okay, hearing none, seeing none. Uh, again, we welcome feedback at any time. Uh, we will be revisiting this uh, policy on March 1st, and, and hopefully we'll be uh, uh, providing a, a version to you for a second read and vote sometime uh, in the future. Um, up next on our agenda is something that uh, the Policy and Governance Subcommittee are grateful that uh, Jake um, presented to us on this Be Safe resolution. The subcommittee last night unanimously voted to recommend that the full committee adopt this resolution on secure gun storage. I'll ask Curtis to read the resolution, and then I'll like uh, possible Jake, if you could say a few words around uh, what's motivating this resolution and, and what we hope to achieve by it. Would you like a second to that uh, no, motion first? No, uh, well, that's a good question. Um, I that's there needs to be a motion. That's right. So that's well, right. That is the, did you say that you unanimously voted to recommend? Well, we it? that's a good question. We didn't clarify what our vote was last night other than a recommendation. So I think probably to be safe, we should probably move it um, and then have it seconded before we before we make a vote. I'll move it. 
Unless you want. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Carrie moves and Ursula seconds. Um, Curtis is going to read the resolution for us all, and then uh, and then we'll hear from Jake around the motivation and, and a bit of background. Take it away. Rock and roll. Uh, Mount Greylock Regional School District Resolution, secure gun storage, thanks to the Plymouth Public Schools, BeSmartForKids.org, and Patry Sardo for language assistance. One of the Mount Greylock Regional School District's highest priorities and greatest obligations to the people we serve in school safety. Uh, while we focus on all areas of safety, this resolution focuses on gun violence prevention through the leadership of the district, information sharing, empowerment, and education of our school community. In partnership with our community, the vision of the Mount Greylock Regional School District is to ensure that our students receive a well-rounded, high-quality education in a safe, accepting, and inclusive environment where all students, families, and staff know they belong. We are committed to empowering all students to become critical thinkers, problem solvers, creators, innovators, and leaders who advocate for themselves, their community, our nation, and the world. The Mount Greylock Regional School District is aware that an estimated 4.6 million American children live in households with at least one loaded unlocked firearm, and that each year roughly, sorry, nearly 350 children under the age of 18 unintentionally shoot themselves or someone else. That is roughly one unintentional shooting per day, and 77% of these incidents take place inside a home. Another 700 children die by gun suicide each year most often using guns belonging to a family member. Research shows that secure firearm storage practices are associated with up to an 85% reduction in the risk of self-inflicted and unintentional firearm injuries among children and teens. And on this document, the footnotes and sources for all of that data are available. The resolution reads as follows. Whereas the U.S. Secret Service National Threat Assessment Center recommends the importance of appropriate storage of weapons because many school attackers used firearms acquired from their homes. Whereas keeping students, teachers, and staff safe from the threat of gun violence should be the responsibility of all adult stakeholders at each of our school sites. Whereas across the country, lawmakers, community members, and local leaders are working together to implement public awareness campaigns, such as Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America's Be Smart program, which is endorsed by the National PTA and which encourages secure gun storage practices and highlights the public safety risks of unsecured guns. Whereas state law requires adults to securely store their firearms. Whereas in order to continue with preventative measures to increase student and school safety, we must act now. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the school committee directs the superintendent and staff to inform the parents and guardians of their legal obligations regarding the secure storage of firearms. Resolved that the school committee and the superintendent will continue to work with local law enforcement agencies, health agencies, and nonprofit organizations to collaborate and increase efforts to inform district parents and guardians of their obligations regarding secure storage of firearms in their homes. Passed and adopted by the Mount Greylock Regional School District on this 12th of January, reads 12th of January 12, edit, uh, 2023, by the following vote. Curtis, thank you, thank you so much for uh, for for reading reading that and and uh, for reading those two earlier policies. Jake, could you uh, could you give us some background into what's motivating this and and what you hope uh, we can achieve by adopting this resolution? I am glad to to give you some background and some history. Uh, one of the names mentioned on on the resolution that Curtis read, and thank you, Curtis, for reading all of those. Uh, was Patrice Sardo. Patrice is a uh, resident that is, is a Williamstown resident who um, I became acquainted with, gosh, probably close to a year ago, but, it, but at least um, last spring. And Patrice has been very active uh, in her previous home in California, now in Massachusetts, and with the nationwide organization of Moms Demand Action. Um, which is a group that started as a result of, of uh, the number of school shootings that have happened in our country over the last 20 years. Um, one of the, Patria and I have had many, many conversations, lots of emails exchanged. 
Um, this this is something that the the Be Smart um, program is is a nationwide program that uh, you know we're we're not talking about somebody's right to own a firearm. That's been well delineated uh, throughout our history here in America and and very recently um, by by Supreme Court decisions uh, uh, around firearm possession really almost anywhere. So what we are talking about though is uh, is is a couple of things. One, the the vast majority of firearm owners that I know are incredibly responsible firearm owners and and they take great care not only in their own approach to to these items that they own but to the approach of of any young people in their home to learn about how serious uh, the, the handling and the owning and the maintaining of a firearm is. Uh, it is very clear in Massachusetts that all firearms are to be secured in a way that young people cannot get at them. Um, but the data, if you will go in and look at, at some of the stuff in those footnotes and some of the information in the Be Smart website, well, school shootings get much press as they should. The, the real tragedy and the real numbers across the country come primarily in the privacy of people's own homes, right where they live. Uh, and, and so we, we really feel joining our, our colleagues in the Plymouth Public Schools on, on the opposite end of the state and, and becoming the first school district in, in Western Massachusetts to adopt such a resolution, should you vote to do so. We are, we are making a statement to our community that um, we, we do not want anything tragic to happen to any family. We do not want anything tragic or accidental to happen to any of, of our children. Uh, in our communities or any of the children that we serve or in the Berkshires or in Massachusetts. Um, I have run this resolution by both of our police chiefs, Chief Dirksen in Lanesboro, Chief Zemba in, uh, here in Williamstown. Um, both are fully supportive of this and will help us in any way. Uh, Patri has been working with all three of our principals to gear up to do presentations in the school um, and to help us develop a website, put some of this information on as a, as a clearinghouse and send things home for families. Uh, and, and so that's really our, our primary aim is keeping kids safe because we do not and cannot and will not face that kind of tragedy, uh, be, it, be it an accidental uh, incident or be it the, the overwhelming number of, uh, of, of students who take their life through suicide because of the availability of an unlocked uh, gun uh, in, their, in their home or in a home that they are close to. We also really, really want to help out empower parents and guardians and caretakers to, to have conversations with the homes that their children are going into about the state of, of, are there firearms in the home? Are they securely locked away? Do they have trigger locks? Um, what, look, everybody on this screen, every single person on here knows how challenging it is to, to have conversations about what's happening in our own home super hard to have conversations about what's happening in homes that our children want, want to be in uh, with their friends and with their peers. We really wanna help parents uh, be empowered to and, and be encouraged, uh, encourage being the key word and the key piece of that word encouraged in this case to, to have that difficult conversation for the, for the good of their child and the good of the child whose home they are visiting. So with, with incredible gratitude to Patri, who has given up an inordinate amount of time to help us be educated administratively around this, um, we will correct any, any errors in this uh, before I ask Christina to sign it with me as the witness. But, but we would appreciate your support for this to, to help us just make a statement and really begin an educational program 
uh, here in our regional school district that serves two wonderful towns that are members and, and several wonderful towns whose students come to us through, through tuition agreements and choice. Um, we do not want anything we, we do not want to not do anything uh, about this when it is so in front of us. We have an amazing resource here in the community. And we honestly hope that every school district uh, and, and our independent school neighbors throughout the county and all of Western Mass will follow suit um, with us taking this action here tonight. So thank you. Yeah, people. thank you, Jake. Thank you, Jake. We, um, as a subcommittee, were, you know, incredibly happy and uh, and enthusiastic about, you know, recommending this for the for the full committee to adopt. Um, and Jake, would you be open to answering questions from the full committee about this resolution? Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Ursula. Uh, not a question. Just I wanted to say how much I support this, and I just. Think it's great it kind of gives me the chills to think about because everything you've just talked about jake is scary and all those things for all of us but i think this is just an awesome resolution and a really great thing for us to do harry um yeah thanks jose my question is more uh, mechanical so how did we um you said that we'll be the first school in Western Mass to sign this, Jake. Um, how did this particular form of the resolution come to us, like from Plymouth Public Schools? Yeah, the, this this was was uh, Patree brought this to me um, probably you know minimum eight or nine months ago, and I walked, you know, her through the process that we take to bring things forward like this. And I and I actually wasn't absolutely sure what the process is for um, for resolutions, which are different than policies. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, first and foremost, I wanted to get the principals together um, with her to have this conversation. The principals and I have had several conversations offline. Um, just really starting with, with is this our role in the community? Um, is this something we should? And, and we are, as an administrative uh, unit, absolutely unanimous in supporting this. Um, uh, I requested of Jose that we bring it through the policy subcommittee, uh, policy and governance subcommittee, simply as a vehicle to get some people who, who live in these two communities weighing in on it before we brought it to the school committee. But really this, this language comes, you know, th this language is largely from the Plymouth resolution, which is largely from uh, the nationwide resolution that that many school districts in many states are examining uh, adoption of, Carrie. Thanks. You're welcome. And, and Jake, just briefly, if you could, um, I think you spoke to this, but maybe remind us about you know, if we were to adopt this resolution, what we plan on as a district to do to help support communities with our partners in law enforcement and and, and elsewhere what do we what do we see as, as moving moving forward and making this resolution meaningful yeah there there are a host of activities we can engage in i i i really see this one as a school committee i see this activity in this conversation we're having here tonight as a really really important piece of that um, we, we are sort of planting our flag in, in the soil of saying, you know, it's, it's a massive uh, responsibility to, to own a firearm and you owe not only yourself, not only the people in your home, but the people in your community to, to follow Massachusetts law and um, and have a firearm perfectly legally owned, but have it perfectly legally stored and away from uh, a young person's access as well. And so this will really kick off. As I said, Patria has been good enough and given so much of her time to meet with each of our three principals. And so we we will be having information online that that helps talk to parents about some of these data points 
that really, um, again, encourages families and gives some, some ways to have this awkward conversation with, with your friends or, or new friends and neighbors in whose home your, your child may be visiting. Uh, and, and we will be offering, uh, you know, meetings for parents and training sessions for parents. And, and then really the, the engagement with, um, with our local police departments, the, the invitation for engagement with other nonprofits, other agencies, is that, um, you know, if, if there's a home where, where you need some help coming up with the, the tools that can be helpful, and making sure you're following the Mass General Law, there are programs that that will help make sure that guns are that, that you have the resources to to secure guns uh, safely. Yeah, thank you, Jake. You're welcome, uh, Christina. Uh, thank you. So, um, my question is an interesting one. I really support this resolution. I think it's fascinating for other school districts in the in our region in our state who are looking to adopt this resolution do we have sort of a roadmap that we can help them get to the next step with adopting a resolution um, based on all the work that you've done with Patri? Yes, and and Patri really is the keeper of the roadmap, and I'm going to struggle to come up with with uh, with her name here this evening. But there's another wonderful individual that lives in uh, in Pittsfield, who who is ready, willing, and able. I made an introduction f with the Pittsfield Public Schools. Um, I'm working through the Berkshire County Superintendent's Roundtable to, to try to make sure. Uh, and, and really, even, even earlier this evening, Patrice sent me a volumes of, of information that can be helpful with this. So, so yes, we, we, there are people ready, willing, and able to, um, to really go anywhere they're needed within the region or anywhere they're invited within the region to help just raise awareness on, on what's really a, a, a vital, vital issue. Awesome, thank you. And thank you, Jake, and, and our community partners for, for bringing this to us. Um, are there any other questions, comments, or concerns that anyone would like to raise before we, before we vote on this resolution? All right, hearing none, seeing none, we'll do roll call vote, alphabetical order. Owen, aye. Conry, aye. Constantine, aye. Elfenbein I. Green I. Malloy I. Sorry. <laughs> Miller I. I switched to my phone, hoping it's a better connection. Thank you, Stephen. We hear you well. Um, okay, good. All right. The motion unanimously passes to adopt the resolution on secure gun storage. Um, thank you, Jake. Thank you, everyone. Back to you, Christina. Thank you, Jose. Next up on the agenda is the superintendent report. So I will turn it over to Jake McCallis, our superintendent. The briefest superintendent's report ever. So you, you may want to mark this. Um, I'm going to time it. <laughs> oh, we, we really, and my lights went out. We really, <laughs> tonight, we just wanted to provide an update because I know your interest. I know everybody that's on, on the Zoom call and, and way, way beyond or interested. Um, we, we do feel like we have an applicant pool now from, from you know, drawing from a couple of different applicant pools from, from different, from the times we have posted this uh, to, to begin moving forward with setting dates for initial interviews for the DEI and B uh, director position. Uh, Jonathan Knopper, our HR specialist, will be reaching out to people tomorrow or Monday to say we're we're here. Please be on the lookout for um, us setting up times. We we are working to identify uh, to get to get the initial committee together uh, that includes three students um, from from 
Mount Greylock Regional School. So I, I will be keeping you updated on this monthly, if not more often through email about where we are with this. But we are very excited to say we're at a point where we, we are moving forward and uh, hope to have an individual named uh, as quickly as we can. And, and thank I, I thank the entire community for their patience with uh, with with including you all with making sure that we get this get this right. So thank you. That's the superintendent's report for this evening. Thank you. Do you that, get that? That, okay. <laughs> that, that has to be a record. That you, you did not lie to us. <laughs> I'll take two hours in February. We'll, we'll make up for it, I'm sure. <laughs> All right. Any questions for Jake on that brief but very important um, update? Okay. Hearing none. Actually, I really think, Jose, to our process of pausing briefly, that perhaps Curtis should could say each time pregnant pause in his voice, just so we know to take a break. I think we should bring that up with the Policy and Governance Committee. Cesura. <laughs> okay. Um, I would like to make a motion to move into executive session with intent to return to open session per MGL Chapter 30A, Section 21A2 to conduct contract negotiations with non-union personnel superintendent. I'll second that. Do we have seconds? Discussion. All in favor? Owen, aye. Conry, aye. Constantine, aye. Elfenbein, aye. Green, aye. Malloy, aye. Miller, aye. Okay, thank you. It is 836, and we will move into a breakout room, Joe, and pause the recording. Or do we have to pause the recording? I think we do just to be safe. And uh, so I can. Okay, we are back in open session. Meeting is recording again. And I would like to make a motion to approve the six year superintendent contract as presented. Do I have a second? Second. second. Oh. I think I'm Julia B. Sorry, Ursula. Ursula. <laughs> <laughs> Any discussion? Yes, thank you. Many thank yous. And um, many thank yous. And uh, this is a uh, what I believe is a real gift to our district for the stability of leadership that we can see um, in the you know next six years. So um, thank you, Jake, for coming on this ride with all of us and leading us um, and uh, doing the wonderful things you're doing. Thank you, Julia. Second that. Okay. As much as I have an innate distrust of bald bearded men, I'm very <laughs> happy to move forward uh, for another six years. Okay, all in favor? Bowen, aye. Conry, aye. Constantine, aye. Elfenbein, aye. Green, aye. Malloy, aye. Miller, aye. Thank you. That motion passes unanimous, unanimously. I'm losing my capability of speaking. Next up on the agenda is another Carrie Green Line item, MASC updates. All right. So um, I went to my first uh, actual serving as a Division Six uh, president board meeting um, and it was a retreat, president's retreat, which happens once a year. Um, a really interesting meeting with uh, talk of resolutions moving into legislation and various other things. So that's why I asked to include the resolutions list that you all looked at um, when you when we had the discussion on whether to support them or not. And the reason was that um, I have to pull up the report. 
Um, resolution six, which is establishment of a regional school assessment reserve fund is currently being moved into legislation. Um, it's an interesting one because it's really um, to enable our municipalities that support our schools to establish a reserve fund. So it's a little bit out of the lane of school committees, but the uh, folks who put this forward felt it was very important for their community to be able to establish something like this. Um, which brings me to the idea of resolutions, right? Of putting forth resolutions. We voted on a resolution tonight, but the resolution that we voted to approve tonight, I believe is already reflecting law, right? So it's not a resolution that would be moved into law if the laws already exist, I believe. Um, is that Mr. Dravis? There we go. Um, but um, we do have the ability to propose resolutions, right, to the committee um, at the state level. And I believe all of you should have received um, an email from MASC inviting you to participate in the various working groups um, of the um, state school committee. So hoping that those of you who wanted to participate did sign up um, to do that. And um, one of the other one of the things that came up in the uh, president's retreat was the NSBA Institute for uh, Equity and Advocacy, and I do plan to attend. So that's happening at the end of this month. Um, I did check with Jake and Christina. Um, I didn't really have time to bring it to the committee to approve, but the MSBA is paying part of my, um, if not all, we haven't worked out the arrangements um, of my expenses and the leadership team of the MASC. So the board president and past president and treasurer and you know the officers are all going and there are a couple of us who are going also as officers at large to learn more about how to advocate for our school districts and for our um, communities and then um, also the issues that we are dealing with you know every day and every budget cycle and everything we talk about in terms of equity inclusion um, being able to uh, serve all of our students. So hoping to bring back that information to this committee. And in fact, there's talk on the MASC board of creating a toolkit around equity. So um, being able to make that available for all school committees. So that's part of um, what we're being tasked to do there. And then um, division six um, at the MASC, um, conference back in October, November, I guess it was, there was a meeting of the division. Um, and most of the folks wanted to learn more about advocacy, right? How do they advocate for the budgets that they need? How do they advocate for rural schools, for transportation? Um, tell us how to do this. So I'm hoping to set up a division six meeting upcoming probably in February. So we'll bring what we learn from this advocacy symposium in DC. That's where the NSBA meetings are in Washington. And um, Jason Frazier from Plimpton, um, who is leading the legislative um, committee of the MASC is planning to join us for that. So that should be, um, you know, a really interesting and helpful session. So just wanted to give you a heads up that that would be coming up on the agenda. If there are any other items that you all would like to recommend um, for division six meeting topics, please just let me know. And I look forward to bringing information back at, uh, in February. Ah, forgot to put this thing down. Thank you.
Julia. Going forward, we'll have um, a standing item on the agenda for MASE updates. Um, so great to have this resource. So thank you, Carrie, for all the time that you're putting into this. It's awesome. Okay, any other questions for Carrie before we move on? Upcoming meetings, field and track project committee to be determined, announced, <laughs> finance January 26th, February 9th at 4 p.m. The next regular session school committee meeting is February 9th at 6 p.m. And the next policy and governance subcommittee meeting is March 1st at 5 p.m. Is the time tentative or the date tentative, Jose? All right, running out of uh, options on my screen here. Um, nothing is tentative at the moment. So that as, as of last night, I think uh, is, is now firmed up. Okay, great, thank you. And Christina, I think we do have a date, which is February 2nd for the track and field project committee okay. meeting. Um, again, with the goal of bringing the final constructing bid documents to the committee on the 9th. Right, great, thank you. Time to be determined on that, probably. It's probably four o'clock. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Everyone keep an eye on the district calendar for updates. Um, I do not have any other items for discussion. Any agenda requests? Uh, yes, one quick one on, I guess this is for the policy subcommittee to take up. So this is something I had uh, brought up before. We have two places, I think, where announcements for meetings are placed. There's the district calendar, and then there's also the school committee page. And so sometimes one has information, the other doesn't. Not a bad idea, just make sure we're clear which one your know, people should be going to, which is the one where we have to make sure things are posted. The other thing is, well, we may not be required to, I think it would be best practices to have meeting documents available to the public 48 hours in advance of meetings so that people can get a sense of what's gonna be discussed, get a sense of whether or not they wanna make a public comment and so on. So more for the policy subcommittee, but thank you. Okay. Ursula would like to make a motion to adjourn. I was just going to volunteer. <laughs> I will move to adjourn. Do I have a second? Miller second. All in favor? Bowen aye. Conry aye. Constantine aye. Dalton Bain aye. Green aye. Malloy aye. Miller aye. Good night all. It is 9.16 and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you everyone. Bye everyone. Go Buffalo Bills. Yes, go Bills.